Hey, this is Elan. I hope you're having a good day and very welcome back to the Holistic Health uh, podcast, episode number 14. And today I'm joined again by the amazing Finn McKenna-Fox. Finn, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much. Good stuff, man. Glad to hear that. Uh, Today, five main topics we're going to go through will be ditching the weighing scales, how you can tone up but not lose weight, Uh, the seven inner child archetypes, healthy boundaries and saying no more often and why you don't need to be in the zone when it comes to doing a workout. So really, you know, kind of important topics and they've been popping up in conversation, um, you know, for me over the last few weeks and thought it'd be interesting to delve into. So ditching the scales, number one. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure like you've, you've seen this, how the scales can really, you know, be a type of self-sabotage you can really get in the way for a lot of people you know that we work with yeah it's such a big one like it's um unfortunately so many of us have a unhealthy relationship with the scales and with weight and <clears throat> without fully understanding like what the numbers is telling us um and like it's one of the things that i see so often with the women that we support is like like they're absolutely killing it with their with their training with their nutrition but like if they still have that unhealthy relationship with the scale is like that just is the thing that just completely like pushes them back and just brings that self-sabotage back in um so yeah like i think it's a really important one to, to speak into yeah for sure and uh a lady that we've been working with i won't mention her name but she's a great example of this so mm-hmm. she said to me i've only lost three pounds over the last eight weeks so I feel like a failure and I'm I'm just doing terribly and then I was like well pause for a second like let's look at all the other things that have happened so the main goal was like to you know feel better in your clothes how many clothes size uh you know have you dropped so far and she was literally like oh yeah I've I've dropped a full clothes size like clothes I was wearing two months ago I literally can't even wear them anymore (laughs) I was like okay so that's that's a big positive, right? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, so many other things. You know, her strength has gone up. She has more energy. She's sleeping better. Uh, but most importantly, she's feeling more comfortable and confident in her clothes. But mm-hmm. if she, if she had just focused on that three pounds that she would lost, she would have been stuck in that "I'm a failure. I'm doing terrible" mindset. So yeah. And like, and again, like, it's like that conversation happens so often where it's like, yeah, like, God, just to feel the weight's not shifting, but it's like, all right, like, again, it's like, how did, how are your clothes fitting? It's like, I've dropped the size. It's like, or like, I can see myself toning up. It's like so many people are commenting how I'm looking and like how good I'm looking and like, I feel really good. But it's like, and like all of these stuff is really positive, but it's like, if that one thing still isn't shifting the way they feel like it should be, like should in inverted commas, like it can just push all of that away. And then, that makes it easier to have a blowout. That makes it easier to feel bad for yourself or feel sorry for yourself and start going backwards. But like that's where like it's just really just switching up that relationship with the scales and looking at everything in a more holistic way. Yeah, definitely. And something I've noticed over the years is that uh, a lot of people tend to base their self worth on the number, mm. and it's so easy just to have that kind of relationship. And you know that's very sabotaging as well because if you're just hyper focused on the one thing then you know it's it's really difficult so i i think that's almost part of our life mission (laughs) (laughs) trying and like help people like just move away from the scales like there are other things you can look at you know you don't have to be especially like a habit of like weighing yourself every day like that's a terrible idea um because the the main difference between male and female bodies is that you know if you have a menstrual cycle your weight is naturally going to fluctuate throughout the week uh throughout the month but yeah. that's that's not you know uh an indication of you actually gaining or losing weight that's just maybe that you're holding on to a bit more water or you know glycogen or, or different things you know they're fluctuating whereas for us as men you know it's still i think it's still an unhealthy habit to weigh yourself every day mm. but because we don't have a cycle you know, if we eat the same and drink the same, our weight will pretty much kind of s- tend to stay the same. So yeah, yeah it's, it's, I think really important to um, realize that, yeah, placing your self-worth on a number could be, you know, kind of disastrous. Yeah. And again, like, I think it's just to kind of go in a little bit deeper into that as well. It's like, it is so important to have things to track and have things to measure and like compare to and stuff like that. 
but it's like it's not doing it to the detriment of everything else and have a plethora of things that you're working with so it's again like it's with the women that we're working it's like yes you can weigh yourself once a month if you want but it's no biggie but like the other things we want to make sure is like is like take your photos have your measurements taken it's like have your clothes that you are you, you know there's a pair of jeans that you can't fit into you feel really uncomfortable in and like have a few items of clothing that you can use as a tracker and a gauge like and when you have a number of these different things that you can go to it's like if you're having a crap there like it's the, the other stuff isn't gonna lie the other stuff isn't good like you, you're fitting into like a, a low a smaller clothes size like that's not lying it's like you're just having a crappy day where you're feeling a bit down but it's one of the things is like the human psyche we're so conditioned to look for the negative yeah. and anyone listening to this is like if i was to ask you name 10 crappy things that happened to you in the last five days you'd be able to go boom 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 and like rattle them off super quick and easy because we're so conditioned to look at that and then on the flip of that i was like name 10 things that you're really proud of for yourself over the last 10 days you might get two or three out and then you'd be paused because we're so conditioned into looking for the negatives and like it's a survival mechanism um whereas with when we're creating a healthy relationship with food creating a healthy relationship with exercise and with our bodies and stuff it's this is where we need to continuously reframe and remind ourselves of that yeah no absolutely it's it's so funny how often like i'll ask and i ask a lot of people the same question every week like what are your three wins for this week and and a lot of people have said to me over the years like i knew you were going to ask me this question and I'm still struggling to come up with answers for it. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it is it is amazing how we we're literally conditioned to just always look for the negative. And mm. like you said, it, it is kind of a survival mechanism because we still have the same brain that we would have had five thousand years ago or ten thousand years ago. But society is so different now. So if you're living in a society ten thousand years ago, uh, you have to look for the negatives because if you don't. You're potentially going to die from yeah, something to try you. <laughs> yeah, like a tribe, or so you know. We had to be conditioned to look for negative things, but but now that's impacting us because we're in a completely different society. And yeah, it's it's really interesting when you to when you delve into how our brains have actually like evolved over you know the years and how we still tend to think the same ways. Um. Mm -hmm. And we will we'll be delving into that kind of like subconscious mindset today because, yeah. you know, really, it's really important to be able to build conscious awareness of what our subconscious patterns are. So things that we're doing without realizing it. Yeah, that's uh, quite a difficult thing to do as well, because it's different for each person. Yeah, uh, but we can delve into some specific examples um, today, especially when it comes to like the inner child uh, stuff. I think that's really interesting um but yeah like ditching the scales overall i think is a great idea and like you said you know there's so many other measurements that you can focus on um and then uh, a lot of things that i like to use as well as like subjective scores like just asking yourself how's my energy today out of 10 um how many hours sleep did i get last night you know what's my mental health score today out of 10 what's my stress levels you know if you see your stress levels drop from an 8 to a 5 that's a positive Mm. see your mental health score go up from a five to a six you know that's a big positive so there's lots of subjective scores that you can look at other than you know objective ones like with the measurements and stuff like that for sure um so moving on to the next topic of how you can tone up but not lose weight uh i think this one tends to confuse a lot of people and you know uh, i think a lot of people think like, okay, I have to lose a stone or I have to lose two stone if I want to feel better in my clothes. Mm. But the reality is that if you want to quote unquote tone up or you want to, you want to look leaner, you want to feel better. Um, you know, you're essentially trying to gain a little bit more muscle on your frame and you're trying to lose body fat. And what tends to happen is like that lady I mentioned earlier, you might only lose three pounds, but you could drop a full clothes size yeah i think in that eight week period um she lost uh 10 inches in total which is a I lot could, i think it was 11 inches all, all, overall was it yeah yeah but like she was very consistent so you know she made it work and it, it was sustainable as well she didn't do anything restrictive she was just yeah on it every week but you know you can see that 11 inches drop but only three pounds yeah 
And it's just because she had got a lot stronger, she gained some muscle, and she had lost a lot of body fat. So her body composition had changed, but her weight not necessarily. Yeah. And I think that's the big one. Like it's such a big one. Like it's when you look at that whole idea, it's like, oh, I only lost three pounds. But with that, it's like you've clearly lost a lot more than three pounds, but it's like your body composition has changed. It's not just your body fat. Like you didn't just lose three pound of body fat. It's like your whole body composition has shifted and changed. Like so, you might lose x amount of pounds in fat. You might have put on x amount of pounds in muscle. But like, and that's one of the things. Like the scales can't differentiate between that. Um, so it's looking at again, like when you just look at that one side of it, it's not going to give a true reflection. Whereas that whole idea of like toning up. And like it's like to be stronger in your body, like you're gonna look leaner, fitter, healthier. Yeah. Well, like it's one of the things as women as well. It's like there's that fear. It's like, I don't want to get really, I don't want to get real bulky and stuff. And I was like, if it was that easy, every dude would be walking around jacked. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it was that easy, I'd literally have like 20 inch arms right now. And <laughs> they're still like just under 15. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, that's kind of funny as well. Like that always makes me laugh. Like, oh, I don't want to get too bulky. It's like, yeah, like it's really not that easy, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that though it, like you still can get results very quickly like um, you know the, the good thing is when you haven't necessarily done a whole lot of training before or maybe you just haven't prioritized it over the last few years once you start to optimize your sleep your food your training uh, managing your stress having more self-care having some boundaries in place you're doing all this like really good personal work your body will start to react very quickly. So mm. like that lady I mentioned, you you can see results uh, quickly to give you a big boost. But then yeah. the real magic happens like when you start to be consistent over a year, two years, five years. Yeah, yeah. Like, and that was it with, with, with that lady that we've been talking about. It's like she went from like super high stress, like no consistency, no rhythm to her life at all. Everything was just being pushed all over the side to like, it's like her sleep's improved. She's got like a really healthy rhythm and routine coming in. She's consistent with her training, with her steps, with her food, all of that stuff. Like it's all of these little micro changes in lots of different areas of her life. That was like, it wasn't difficult to implement. It was just a matter of just bringing more awareness to what she was doing. And again, that's one of the things that we can't say it enough to to anybody who's doing this work. It's like you don't have to come through and completely overhaul every single aspect in one day. It's going to be a slow burn. It's like we're just going to like peel back the layers, just get everything kind of coming back in a little bit more balance and alignment for yourself. And like over the, over the course of four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, that's where it all just feels really natural and normal for yourself with the changes you're implementing. Yeah, no, definitely. And that's one of the reasons why I've started doing longer programs. And most people, we focus on four to six months, at least, because yeah. you more time to implement those changes. And it's less stressful as well. It's like you can take a deep breath, relax. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, we'll do one thing this week. And then <laughs> yeah. once you have that one thing done, yeah, let's do the second thing, you know, keep it nice yeah. and simple. Um, but going back to body composition, um, some examples that came to mind, um, when I started training, uh, back in, uh, like April, 2012, I was 66 kg. And then by 20, was it 2017, mid 2017, I got to 102 kg. So I literally gained, what was that? 32, 36 kg. And I looked way leaner at 102 versus 66 because yeah. over that like five year period, I had just been really consistent. I gained a lot of muscle, made big changes and I got a DEXA scan and I could see I was in like the top, I don't know, from the studies they'd done, I was in like the top 3% of people in terms of muscle mass and my frame and height and stuff like that. And that's obviously an extreme example, but it's like, I was literally 36 kg heavier, yeah, way lighter. Now I'm 92, so I've I've lost 10. I feel a lot fitter and I'm better now because being heavier doesn't feel great on your cardio. Yeah. And I can then on the on the flip of that, I know for myself, I'd say from I was about 16 until um I was 33, I pretty much fluctuated between 74 to 76 kgs. And it was like with that, like and when I look at that, it's like between 74 to 76 kgs and 
my body composition, how I looked and how what I was doing was such drastic changes. There were periods where I was like completely like jacked and ripped doing CrossFit. There was periods I was really lean doing like doing marathons and like an ultra runs. There was everything in between. There was periods where I had the dad bod and, and like it was doing very little training, but like it was all a stayed in around that 70, 74, 76 kg mark. And it's only been in the last few years where I've made a lot of bigger changes and all the things where I've actually started to put on more muscle, like because it's just I've changed a lot of big drastic things for myself. So I've started to change more. But like it's one of them things when you look at it, it's like like I look back at photos and you, it's crazy to see the difference. But I knew it was the same weight the whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, another example as well. It's like um, a lot of fighters before a fight they need to drop a lot of weight quickly and a lot of them will drop like it's really unhealthy as well but they'll drop anywhere from like 8 to 10 kg in like a week and they yeah. literally do that by just uh what's called water loading so they literally just deplete their body of water they load up on a lot and then they get rid of it all yeah and they lose 8 to 10 kg but it's like it's not they might lose a tiny bit of muscle maybe some body fat but it's like majority water yeah. As soon as they start putting fluids back into their body, having electrolytes, they gain that full yeah. 18 kg back. Yeah. So like you could literally drink a two liter bottle of water right now. You wouldn't feel too good, but you could do it as an experiment and you would probably be exactly two kg heavier if you were to yeah. step on the scales and you've just manipulated your weight because of water intake. And there was yeah. nothing to do with muscle or fat or anything like that. And so you know i think it's just good to have those practical understandings of how like if you weighed yourself this morning and you were let's say 70 and you weighed yourself this evening and you're 74 you haven't gained 4 kg of body fat you've gained 4 g 4 kg because you've drank water you've had food you know maybe you haven't gone for a number two recently yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it could be up to 74 and then go to the toilet and see what it is after like it's exactly yeah. So there's all these like different factors to consider that are affecting weight, you know? Yeah. Um, okay, perfect. So next topic was going to be on the inner child. And yeah. like, this has been, you know, really deep work that I've been doing, like since I started working, you know, with a therapist the last few years and I read, you know, a few really good books on it. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on it. Cause I think like um, something I've realized for myself is, um, a lot of different experiences I had when I was younger has molded me in a certain way so that I still, you know, um, when I get stressed, it, like right now, even like as an adult, I'll almost default back into how I was when I was a child. So I think um, it's a pretty common thing for a lot of people. You know, if you haven't done inner child work before, it's very easy to you you default back to that kind of childlike state when stress starts to get higher or you're in situations that are uncomfortable um so the archetypes i thought were like a really interesting thing that a lot of people could relate to um so i was just going to like read them off and then we can see kind of what we relate to and i'm sure anyone listening you know if you want to drop a comment down below if you wanted to share it'd be really interesting yeah so, these are the seven inner child archetypes. So the first one, the abandoned child. This archetype often feels deserted, alone, or neglected, seeking security and reassurance. Uh, so I can definitely relate to that in ways because of, you know, only having seen my biological father one time when I was six and then met up with him again last year. But I definitely had, you know, an element of that abandoned child feeling when I was younger, for sure. Mm. Um, the invisible child representing feelings of being unseen, unheard or unnoticed. This archetype craves validation and recognition. Um, I can actually relate to that a little bit as well. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's one of the things like so many of us will relate to a number of them. Like it's it's yeah. such a big one. So third one, um, the pleaser. The pleaser archetype seeks approval and acceptance by prioritizing others' needs over their own. Uh, the unlovable child, this archetype struggles with feelings of unworthiness and believes they are undeserving of love. The fearful child, characterized by 
anxiety and fear. This archetype seeks safety and security in a threatening world. Uh, the wild child representing spontaneity and creativity. This archetype embodies freedom and un uninhibited expression. Um, and the last one, the overachiever, driven by a need for perfection and validation through accomplishments. This archetype strives for success at all costs. And that's also another one that I can relate to. <laughs> yeah. So three popping up for me there, for sure. Um, was there any in particular that popped up for you? Yeah, definitely. It's like um the overachiever. The I can't remember the name of the ones. Like it's like the seeking the validation, and like it's again so much of that sort of stuff. Like when we look at the inner child work, and when we look at our subconscious program, and it's it's it gives us a glimpse and an understanding into why we do what we do, why we act the way we act, why we react to things the way we react to things, and. I think it's like it's such an important topic to understand because I I I can even see it. It's like through working with the women through the program and stuff like that. It's like when life challenges come up, you can see the reactions in them and how they respond to certain situations play out. And like that's still like that's happening because of this unresolved stuff that they've never probably looked at. And being able to help and coach them through that, it's it's gonna be it's it's a huge one where it's because to get healthy it's not just a matter of having a nutrition plan and an exercise program it's all of the other stuff that's going on underneath the surface that's going to make sure that you're able to actually stick to it and implement the changes whereas if you're not looking at that stuff just hoping that this training and nutrition is going to fix all it's like you're you're only looking at like a tiny part of the, the puzzle yeah for sure that's something i've been you know saying for a long time is like if we don't look at your patterns and behaviors that are underneath all the stuff that we're doing it doesn't matter what changes you make to your food or training because when you do eventually have a stressful situation um at some point you're going to revert back to old patterns and so the only well one of the ways that you can work through that is just by bringing conscious awareness to them mm -hmm. and the good thing is like you know i i'm very uh you know clear on the fact that I'm not a therapist, I'm not a counselor. And, you know, the good thing is um, I'm happy to refer someone if they want to go into that on a deep level. Mm. We're just addressing it on like a surface level of like, okay, let's bring awareness to this as like a first step. Yeah. And then like when you do that, it's like if you did want to go into a deeper, it's like that's what therapists and counselors are there for to help you go into that. But, um, you know, I've even like a good few clients that I've worked with over the years have been, you know, therapists and counselors. And, and we spoke a lot about these kind of topics and they've literally all said to me that, you know, they see what I'm doing as kind of like a good introduction. Um, Cause then if I refer people over to them, they've already kind of started some of the work mm. um, at a kind of an easier level. Yeah. So and that's that it. And I guess like so often is like this work complements what, what therapists and counselors are doing so much. Like I've had a lot of clients over the years who had been going to a counselor before seeing me then with the work that we were doing together, the counselor, like the next, like they might see the counselor like once a month or once every two months. And like when they go back, they're like, what, what have you been doing? Because whatever you're doing, keep doing it because everything is just sticking and landing so much more because we're just hitting it from a number of different angles. And like, and I think that's one of the things like when we're able to bring our health into a more alignment with ourselves, everything else is easier than to start building out from there. Yeah, no, for sure. And uh, I thought a good practical example of inner child work uh, conversation I had recently. Uh, and I think this is common for a lot of people, but this lady in particular, uh, her dad passed away when she was young and so what ended up happening was she essentially became the fixer in her family, but she was really young at the time. And even now in her fifties, she's still in that fixer role. Mm. So the way that that affects her is that as soon as anything goes wrong in her family, she feels the need to have to go and fix that situation, which ultimately ends up in her not um, prioritizing herself so what happened over the last few years is she basically started to really struggle because 
um you know she was always taking care of everybody else and then everything for her started to you know to suffer like her mental health she didn't have time for self-care you know she didn't have time for doing any type of workouts or training or yoga yeah. or like that and so she was last on the priority list for, yeah. for so long and it all started with um what she experienced when she was younger with losing her dad mm. so i thought that was a really powerful you know thing that popped up and it's a good example of how one thing way back then can still affect you you know yeah. 40 years later if you haven't maybe addressed it yeah and again yeah like it's it's one of them things like it's such a big underpinning for so many people like if we're aware of it if they're aware of it or, or if they're not it's that seeking validation and seeking love seeking acceptance from those closest to them and like if like that's where we warp everything to try to think oh, like, oh i'm gonna do this because that's gonna give me validation that's gonna get acceptance like you're not consciously thinking all of this stuff but it's something that you've just been doing for so long like because it's one of like it's the truth of the matter is is like when we look at our subconscious thoughts it's like we've got our conscious thoughts that are the things that we are thinking about and we put thought and effort into our subconscious is everything below the surface and it's basically you're going to be having 98 percent of the same thoughts every single day and so like and it's like if when you think about that it's crazy because we're just such like uh we're so habitual people we're such a habitual race where we just continuously overlap and going back over the things that are deep and buried down and that's what makes us do what we do and like a, like a really nice way to kind of, a good way to kind of look at it and kind of think about our subconscious thought is like if you have like there's this like a beautiful story where it's like there's two two twins and two boys that were brought up in this household that was a really rough household and their father was an alcoholic and he abused them and like they had a really rough household and then it went and interviewed the two boys whenever they were in their 40s and like one of them was like a super successful businessman and like when it asked them is like how how are you like because of the lifestyle that you had had and the upbringing that you had how are you successful right now and he said it was because of the, the how my father was that's what made me who i am now Whereas when it looked at the twin brother, he was a drop deep beat. He was a bum. He was like, he was an alcoholic and everything as well. But his idea, his story was because of the upbringing I had, this is why I am here. So it's like this subconscious that both of them had different subconscious programming and things that they made them believe and understand who they were and what, what they were. And then that dictated so much of their life. And again like kind of coming back into like the the inner child archetypes that's it's the same idea of it it's like you are doing the same things that you're doing because you believe that's what is right for you that's where that's the story that you have created for yourself so you're collecting the evidence to meet that story that you created for yourself whereas by just shining a light on it becoming aware of it by challenging it a little bit that's going to allow you to start breaking that story down and starting to rewrite that story to be something a bit more healthier and a bit more aligned with the version of you that you want to be yeah i've got goosebumps <laughs> <laughs> that's a, it's such a good story for sure um and like that's a true story yeah like it's one that i've heard from like, a number of different different times is a like a beautiful like i don't know if it's true or not but it's a story that i've heard and like you can relate to it. like if you've seen all aspects of that if it's true or if it's not i've seen aspects of that so much yeah. like in so many different people oh for sure yeah no, that's amazing yeah i was thinking on uh, like subconscious thought i've seen a, a good photo before it's like the iceberg analogy so the tip of the iceberg is our conscious thought you can only see you know what's on the surface it's a very small amount but then when you look under the surface it's like 95 percent of the iceberg is there and it's like massive but it's all hidden away in yeah the and yeah that's what i've seen before from any study i've done it's like we're using our logical brain five percent of the time and 95 percent of the time we're using our emotional or our subconscious brain because it just saves more energy for our brain to put things on autopilot um <clears throat> so yeah i think like if anyone's watching this or listens to this if the probably the most powerful thing you could do is those seven inner child archetypes just write down what can you relate to on those mm. that would be you know a good yeah. for sure and i think that's it like it's the first step of it is just becoming aware 
like it's just becoming aware and then just once you have that awareness just start noticing when it plays out more and more for yourself like because it's one of them things that gets it's great listening to this like oh that's really cool and then doing nothing with the information whereas by writing it down that's going to lock it in your subconscious so then it's going to allow you to be more aware of it so then when you say see yourself playing out in certain patterns when you're reflecting back and it like oh that was me doing this because of that so then it's allowing you to start understanding why you do what you do a bit more and then that's the first step is just becoming aware and then just start questioning and chipping away at that and just to start to start breaking it down. Yeah, for sure. That's something that's been happening as like an inner monologue for me over the last couple of years now that I have more awareness of it. Every time I feel stressed about something, I look into it like a little bit deeper. So like uh, an example, I am I have my full driving test uh, in a couple of weeks and I just never bothered to get it because I never needed it. You know, I was living in the city and stuff like that. Um, and so I've been doing like more lessons. I think yesterday was like my 15th lesson. And so he's there giving out to me, you know, telling me about my mistakes and all that kind of stuff. And then afterwards, you know, I I felt a bit, you know, dejected or I just didn't feel great about it. And then I was thinking like, okay, I feel stressed right now because Michael was telling me that I made a mistake here. And anytime I make a mistake, I feel you know, like I'm not valued or I feel stupid. So then that makes me, you know, feel angry in a way. Mm. You know? So I had this whole monologue of like, okay, this and this and this. And, but I was able to consciously kind of think through it and be like, okay, it's like, I'm not actually angry or, or stressed right now. It's just like, he was pointing out mistakes I made and it's okay to make mistakes. Yeah, you know, Mistakes are part of what's going to help me improve. Yeah. Whereas, I know for sure if I'd done that years ago, I just would have been angry and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There, there would have been so no good. other, you know, you know, conscious thought about why I'm feeling the way I'm feeling. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Um, so next one is healthy boundaries and saying no more often. Um, so, you know, I think this topic, I mean, they're all important, but like how often do you find yourself in a situation where you you're like you feel compelled to say yes like it's it's pretty often if you've never done boundary specific work before yeah um i think even before getting into this you're like do you want to kind of give a little bit of a definition of what boundaries are like some people might hear like we know what they are but we don't actually know what they are so i think it could be cool to kind of give a little bit of a spiel on what on what boundaries are yeah sure so my interpretation of boundaries would be, you know, if you have, well, I think it starts with your own values as well. So let's say one of my values is that I want to feel good. I want to have energy. You know, I want to, I want to be able to wake up in the morning and, you know, um, just have good mental health. So they'd be some of my values. So a boundary then related to, to some of those values would be like, okay, if I want to have good mental health, that means like, I don't really want to go to festivals or nightclubs or bars anymore and get pissed drunk and have five shots of vodka in a row like I did before and blackout and do stupid shit like that, you know? Because if I did cross that boundary, then that's that's having a big impact on a really important value mm. of my mental health and feeling good. So my boundary now is like, I've no problem with drinking alcohol. I'll have like, you know, max two or three drinks and I don't want to have any more than that. So if someone is like, I'll go on, have some more. I'm just like, no, I'm fine. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my boundary. That's where, that's where the line is, you know, for me right now. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Like, yeah, like, and it is like it's it's just what's them things that we're put them parameters that we're putting into place to support the core decisions that we want for ourselves. And like, some people are really good at it, but a lot of people are pretty poor at actually putting in healthy boundaries. Um, but again, when you look at it, it's like a lot of people struggle putting in healthy boundaries because of all of the inner child stuff that you were talking about and everything before. Whereas if you have an innate feeling and belief with inside of you that you need a pe you need to be a people pleaser like you need to do things to please other people because that's your way of seeking validation that's where you're seeking a val seeking love seeking acceptance is like of course you're going to put your stuff to the side 
to make other people feel happier. So that's where like you don't have a lot of boundaries. And you see this so often, like see this a lot with with our clients, where it's like like they haven't been prioritizing their exercise or they haven't been uh, getting on top of their food and all of them things over long periods of time because they haven't had time to do it. But then when you look at where they're spending their time, it's like, oh, like family members were coming over and expecting them to do this. Or the kids are expecting them to like run the roads all the time and, and like without giving any notice and stuff. And like you're just saying yes to everybody else, but you're saying no to yourself. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. And that's that's one of my favorite quotes that I found recently. It's like every time you say yes to someone else, you say no to yourself. Mm. so yeah that's why the boundaries are so important because if you're constantly just saying yes all the time like when are you ever going to have time for your health your mental health you know time for self-care you know when do you get time to de-stress you know if you're constantly in that mode of just saying yes all the time to whoever your boss your kids your partner yeah. it's like you're the one that's going to suffer and then that just feels horrible you know yeah. so, and it, like this is like really difficult to do because when you have been saying yes for years it's a learned behavior it's subconscious at that stage you know so it's gonna take time and it, it takes a lot of courage as well to just be mm -hmm. like no i'm okay like i i didn't just get to this point now where i can talk of like you know if i'm with some friends or whatever have two or three drinks like it's still a struggle for me you know yeah uh, but I've got better at saying no over the last four or five years, uh, but yeah. in a very gradual process and I've messed up on it lots, you know, so yeah. you're going to mess up on it a lot as well. If this is something yeah. that you're, you want to change, but eventually, you know, it will become easier. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I think it's just like, it doesn't have to be massive things either. Like you said, you know, like uh, if you have kids, like let's say they're teenagers this is a, literally a conversation i had the other day like if you're waiting around all day just to jump whenever they say jump and you know you don't have any boundary there it's uh it's really going to have a big impact so even just like having that conversation of like i'll be available you know at, at this specific time or i'm busy at you know at these times you need to let me know you know you're just you're just setting it out there and, and being clear about it yeah um you know, it's a good way to start off. Yeah, like, and I think a big thing with it as well, it's like when you look at starting to bring in these healthy boundaries for yourself, like we need to remember that you're going to be constantly challenged with them because if you have never had healthy boundaries, if you were always saying yes to everybody else and then like you're finally kind of like get the courage to it's like, right, I'm actually going to put myself forward and going to, I'm going to start looking after myself first. Like you're the one that's made that decision. You're the one that knows that. But if everyone else is so used to you, jumping for them and like again i see this with like a number of my clients it's like we're like they're the per they're the they're the sibling in the family who does everything and like every other sibling like relies on them to do everything so then like whenever you stop doing that everyone else still sees you as oh your role is this you have always done this so why are you saying no to it now so like everyone has got to start feeling challenged and it's got to actually put, shine a light on other people around you stuff as well because they had such an unhealthy reliance on you for so long so like that's when you know and understand that you're going to start putting in boundaries in the place like it's going to be challenged but the easiest way to work around that is open 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 communication like trying to just get really good at just actually it's not just saying i'm, I'm just saying a hard no it's like starting to like like first things first like don't wait to a situation where you have to give a yes no answer to then impose it whereas if you can put something in first um so like with like the likes of yeah like they go with like your the same, like go with your kids for instance like the example that you were given like the kids like you're just waiting around for them every evening to figure out where they need to be run whereas rather than get that happen and you just said no i can't do that now in the moment they're going to be but like you should always do this you have to <laughs> whereas if you sit down and have a conversation with them if they're at, if they're teenagers it's like so this is something that i've been noticing that's been going on it's like i'm always going to be here and be available for you but also I'm trying to start looking after myself first. I'm starting to try to look after my health first. I've got classes that I want to do. I've got plans that I need to make around my nutrition and stuff. So this is something that I'm doing for myself. And I would really love your support with that. So what that means moving forward from here, I'm still going to be make myself available to help you and to collect you and to drop you somewhere. But I need you to give me time. I need you to give me notice. 
like let's like have a calendar that you write stuff up on the calendar that way of what you know is coming ahead so when it comes that we can all actually plan and communicate around it a lot easier so again that's you putting the groundwork in first putting the boundaries in place first explaining them first so there's an open dialogue around it so then when it actually comes to an evening where it's like you get a phone call when you're ready to start doing a workout and your kids need you it's like come on it's like we've had this conversation so then it's got to just it's just got to you're going to find it's going to be easier to start bringing that stuff into play yeah for sure and i think with uh if you've had long-term friends it might be a difficult one because what you'll most likely run into is some people they might not respect that new value or boundary that you have so that could be a thing like yeah. you, you want to keep moving forward but maybe they want to stay stuck where they are yeah so you have that disconnect and and that's you think you're better than us now <laughs> too, good, too good to stay out booze until all hours really, really, yeah. <laughs> so that that is the hard part it's like you know when when you're in kind of like a growth mindset some people are are in that they just want to stay stuck you know mm. um and that's is one of the difficult things about it for sure um so hopefully most people that you have around you will be supportive for sure um like when i went on holidays recently with my parents my sister the norm of our holidays it's not a lot of alcohol definitely not but the the norm before was like okay any time we'd have lunch or dinner um usually you know we'd have a couple of drinks or something with it but then when i went on holiday recently before i went and i even felt nervous before having the conversation i was like look i i don't want to drink any alcohol on this holiday because like I want to be in a good mood. I want to, you know, when we're going to a museum or we're going for a walk, I want to be feeling really good and be energetic and, you know, be the best that I c you know, can be when I'm with you. And then my mom was like, yeah, no, that's, that's fair enough. So then when we were at dinner or lunch, you know, it'd be almost like a automatic, you know, like, Oh, what, what do you want to drink? And I'm like, I'll just have a coffee or I'll just have whatever a pineapple juice or something. Yeah. Uh, so I did that and I felt way better on the holiday, much more energy and my mood was, you know, hundred percent better. So I think that's like an example of something that I've done recently and I did find it difficult, mm. but it was just like setting the, the intention being clear and specific beforehand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And like, and it's like, it's a skill that we need to develop. So it's just start small start creating some wins in it get more confidence in it and over time like you'll feel like you'll be able to get better and better yeah definitely okay um last one was you don't need to be in the zone to do a workout and <laughs> this is kind of a funny one because like uh the amount of times someone has said to me oh i was this close to not coming to the class today <laughs> <laughs> and it's the best like, class ahead <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm always like oh thank you so much for coming because you know it's it's in that moment where you're like, oh, will I, won't I? Like, if you make the decision of like, yes, I'm going to do it. Like, that's what's going to help you to get all the results you ever wanted, you know, with your fitness and strength and, and stuff like that. But yeah, the idea of like having to be in the zone or in a good mood or in the right frame of mind or however you want to phrase it. It's like, <clears throat> I think it's just a type of procrastination because um, the truth is like, over the last uh how many years i've been training almost exactly 12 years i started going to the gym and like the amount of times i have not been in a good mood or i've had a headache before going or haven't felt good it's been like at least 95 to 99 percent of the time but i still went and did it anyway and always felt better afterwards yeah so i've always just like hung on to that feeling of like okay i don't want to go and do this that's fine but i know for sure if I do do it, I'm going to feel way better. So that's, it's worth it, you know? Yeah. But, yeah. I guess such a big one. Like it's like, it's like a, a really good, nice way. I've been looking at that lately. It's looking at not relying on our emotions to dictate our actions. And it's like, if you're, cause if you're, if you think about it, if you're just relying on your emotions and like, and how you're feeling to dictate everything that you're going to do, you're probably not going to do a lot of stuff. You're going to be really gentle on yourself all of the time whereas looking at it as like right you say you want to train you want to do something like again as as you said it's like there's so many times where you've had a headache you've no energy you've got every other excuse as to why you should do it but when you do it you feel so much better for it and you're always so glad that you do 
And like I know for myself, like a big I've had a big relationship with this over the last number of years. And it's changing that perspective of what it looks like as well. Because like there's that whole idea of like we need to have discipline and consistency and stuff, but that doesn't mean you have to give 110% every single workout. Like it means like you're showing up and you're doing it. Like you might feel really flat, you mightn't have the energy. So I'm going to still show up and move my body in some shape or form and see how that feels on the day. I can know that it might like I might only give like 60, 70 percent in that workout, but that's way better than giving nothing. And then the days where I do have the energy, I can push myself so much harder. And like and it's, it's changes the game so much more. And then that allows you to start building that consistency and building them long term changes and then long term goals that you want to start following through. Yeah, discipline is a word that I love because I'm like, do you actually need to be more disciplined or do you actually just need more support and accountability? Mm. I, I think in most cases, most of the time, we just need more support because if we had that support, we'd show up, you know? Yeah. It's like, I wouldn't be doing driving lessons if I didn't have the support from Michael, my instructor. Yeah. I, w- I wouldn't be doing Spanish lessons or improving with that if I didn't have Sofia to give me accountability or the same with you know my coaches in jiu-jitsu and, and stuff like that so i think that's a good reframe it's like you probably don't need to be more disciplined it's like if you had the right support and you know you someone's got your back and they're helping you it's much easier to get better at whatever it is or to feel better or you know um so yeah that's the, something i've kind of changed over the last years because i think a lot of people are in that mindset like oh i have to be like hard on myself super disciplined military style yeah you know, but it goes back to like i remember i don't know if it was in one of the last the previous episodes that we spoke about it or else just in one of our conversations where like you're like you just broke it down it's like so many people that it gets new year's day and you start and you go hell for leather with your training plan and your nutrition and after about two weeks it gets too much and then you just throw the towel in and then you do nothing for a few months and then you get another burst of energy in April time and you go again for another few weeks. It might last a couple of weeks longer and then it gets too much and then you throw it in. And then you might do that one more time in the middle of the year. And like when you look at it over the course of the year, like you might have had something like 10, 12 weeks of like really good solid training, really good nutrition, but the rest of it was all a write off. Mm-hmm. Whereas it's looking as like if you kind of if you can have more of that long term vision, that long term goal is like, all right, let's show up, not like not break, break myself every single day, every single week, but do it consistently and show up even the days that I don't want to show up. And like over the course of the 52 weeks of the year, like you're going to have so much more progress than what you would have. Yeah, definitely. Uh, something like a little mindset, like switch that I make sometimes I think like okay, if I really don't want to go and train today, so like what's the easiest thing that I could do? Like literally the simplest, easiest thing. And a lot of the times it's like, okay, I'll just, you know, go to the gym and maybe I'll do like a really light set of whatever, you know, doesn't matter what the exercise is, you know, just mm-hmm. a really easy set. Or I'll, or I'll literally just go to the gym and I'll just do some stretching or Some days if I didn't want to go to the gym, it's like, okay, I'll just stay at home and I'll do a little bit of shadow boxing or, you know, I'll watch some tutorial video that I was watching the other day and I'll practice some footwork or something fun or. And I, I pretty much always find like, if I do start with something simple, I'll find my energy coming up and be like, oh yeah, maybe I'll just do one, one other thing. Yeah. Yeah. One thing. I can say like five minutes is better than no minutes, but then it's very rarely like you stop at that five minute mark yeah so good stuff but um yeah i think that's uh pretty much all we need to go through for today uh really important topics um we'll come up with some some more topics for for the next one um it's good that we've been keeping each podcast we've been doing you know uh pretty different and you know but they're all important topics but they all had like a you know different flavor to them Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it was, was really good to chat and, you know, I love having these kind of conversations cause, um, you can really take a deep dive into so many different avenues. And I think it's, you know, really powerful stuff and stuff that I love to talk about as well. You know, it's very rare. Um, that was one of my issues growing up was like, I love to talk specifically about topics. I don't like general chit chat or <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the football like, at the oh, weekend. <laughs> like I, I hate that kind of stuff. But yeah, 
I love when there's like one kind of specific topic and taking a deep dive into it. So, you know, it's been really amazing to to do that, you know, with you over the last few podcasts and and looking forward to the next few. Awesome, man. Nice. But um, if you're watching or listening to this and you found it helpful, uh, just drop a comment down below or, or leave the like. And, you know, if you think someone else will find it helpful, share it with them. We'd really appreciate it. And yeah, that's pretty much it for today. We'll see you on the next one.